Hello class, and uh, welcome to this week's discussion on social enterprise. I'm just going to skip right to it. <clears throat> so this week, the discussion is going to center around the insights of Barry Bozeman in this week, in this book, All Organizations Are Public. He said that all organizations are on a spectrum between public and private. Not that none of them are entirely public, and none of them are entirely private. Nonprofits fit obviously somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Um, For-profit corporations fit all the way over on this side of the spectrum. But in the middle, we have social enterprise occupying that middle space. Public organizations are ones that get their resources from political authority. Um, if they get their resources from economic authority, they uh, are private organizations. So if, you, if most of your resources come from the fact that you have public support, that you have politicians on board, you're probably more likely to be a public organization, says Barry Bozeman. If most of your resources come from the fact that you have money and you have contract uh, power and power within the marketplace, then most of your, or, if you, uh, then you're probably going to be a private corporation. He also pointed out that public organizations, with his, uh, with the co-author Stephanie Moulton, that public organizations are more likely to create what he calls realized public value. That is value that isn't really profit. It's not about money. It's about um, uh, it's about helping people, really. It's about doing something for society, doing something for um, the, the uh, political body, as opposed to profit, right? And in the middle, you have organizations that sort of pivot toward thinking about realized public value. They try and act like organizations that do, that are public, right? And then we have other organizations that try and act like organizations that are private. Now, social enterprise sort of breaks down these, these things. It tries to be both private, public and private, and it tries to create realized public value and economic value. On the input end, it has political resources that it tries to build, but it also uses a lot of economic resources and money and whatnot. So let's take some examples. Here's how I define a uh, social enterprise. Oh, let's see, where is it? There we are. So I define social enterprise as where social mission and market mechanism are so closely interrelated that you can't really separate one without the other. You have a social mission that you want to meet. That's your primary goal of the organization. And you need to do it somehow using a market mechanism. You need to do it somehow using the capitalist marketplace, right? Or you have a marketplace urge that you want to get to, and you can't do it without somehow meeting a, a social mission. Okay, they're so intertwined that you can't really separate out the two. So let's take some examples. The Denver Center for the Performing Arts is a theater. It's a huge theater right here in Denver. They're about to have Hamilton. Uh, they also have Zoe's Perfect Wedding, and uh, the Colorado Symphony performs there, as well as the ballet and the Colorado Opera. They are a nonprofit, 501c3 organization. So they are getting a lot of their money from donations uh, and from uh, grants and from the government. But they're also getting a lot of their money from ticket sales. And if they don't sell tickets, they're not going to be able to meet their obligations. So they have to play in the marketplace. They have to engage in the marketplace to do what they want to do. Right? So here they really have this interweaving of social mission and market mechanisms that they couldn't do one without the other. There's no way to have a theater that nobody attends. And to get people to attend in the way that we run it in our system, you need to understand the marketplace. You need to understand how to do it in the marketplace. Huh. Uh, I can't get to my next tab. Here we go. All right. So here's the Women's Bean Project. They also are a 501c3 nonprofit. They take people who have obstacles to employment, such as addiction or a previous history with the incarceration system, and they put them to work making bean soup and other products, right? These are people who can't get work, so they give them work. But in order to give them work, they have to sell the products, right? They could possibly do this. They could possibly do this by just training them without actually selling the bean soup and the coffee and the other things that they sell, and the, they sell jewelry as well. They could do their mission just by training and putting them into a fake um, employment setting, 
but a fake employment setting wouldn't be as convincing and it wouldn't make them feel confident that they could enter into a real employment setting as well. So the Women's Meme Project sort of needs the market mechanisms to function alongside the social mission, right? So they're completely intertwined. They can't be disintertwined. Now, those are both on the nonprofit end, right? They're, they look more like nonprofits than like, than like corporations, right? If we were to say there's corporations on one end, nonprofits on the other end, in the middle of social enterprise, they're around here. But on the other end, we've got things like uh, Patagonia, which I'm not so sure it's a social enterprise. What they're doing is creating outdoor gear. They're creating clothing, but they're doing it in a way that helps people, the manufactory, uh, the manufactories, right? They make sure that their people are paid enough. They don't work crazy hours. They work in safe and ha healthful conditions. Um, they also make sure that the way that they make their clothes are environmentally sound, right? Um, and it's part of their mission, they think, to make clothing that is environmentally sound and that is socially responsible. That's part of their mission. That's what they want to achieve. But they also want to achieve profit, right? And they probably primarily want to achieve profit. Um, and that's one thing about what they, they, so they're sort of crossing out of social enterprise and into corporate social responsibility, which is to say they want to do right while they're making money, right? They want to do good while they're doing good, okay? Um, and that seems more like a branding strategy, a marketing strategy. So this is from the Huffington Post, why corporate responsibility is an essential branding strategy. So in this case, corporations, private corporations are learning from nonprofits, saying we have to have that political authority that Bozeman talked about, not just the economic authority to have contracts, but also the political authority, otherwise people aren't gonna buy our goods. They're saying we want profit, but we need political authority to get that profit, proving once again that Bozeman was right, that all corporations are, or, or all organizations are indeed public, right? This book took it a step further, um, looking behind the label by Bert Bartley, Coast Samuel, Samuel, and Citrini and Summers. And they took it a step further by saying, they actually went in to see how many of these corporations that say they're doing corporate social responsibility and making their goods in an ethical way, how many of them actually are? And they found that very few of them actually were. They would do it right to the point where they could start turning a blind eye and then they'd start to turn a blind eye. One of the exceptions was Patagonia. That's why I highlighted them. But a lot of electronics manufacturers in particular were not doing what they said they were doing or they were doing it to the letter, but not to the spirit, all right? So of course, this, is, this book tends to argue that corporate social responsibility is primarily focused not on helping people, but on branding, on making money. So let's look at another organization and consider that the difference between corporate social responsibility and social enterprise. Okay, so this is an organization that the only thing they do, they're a limited low profit liability corporation, which means that they... Um, can only make a certain amount of money. They're not allowed to make more than a certain amount of profit every year. What they do is they make stoves that are clean so they can replace people who are burning all kinds of dirty things like, like bad wood and trash to sort of to cook their fire. So they, they make these stoves and they can burn wood, but they can also burn a variety of other things that are much cleaner. And uh, in doing so, and they can burn wood down to charcoal so it burns its own smoke. Um, so th they, what they do is they sell these for cheap or give them away sometimes to people in developing world countries who don't have access to clean cooking materials. Um, they save the lives of, the, of a lot of these people in these countries because indoor cooking on wood burning fireplaces can cause all kinds of asthma and lung damage. And then they use the carbon credits they get for reducing the amount of carbon that is being used by these people in these other countries. And they sell those carbon credits and they get their money that way. So they sell the stoves at cost. They don't make any money on the cost. But they sell the carbon credits to help the environment and they get their money that way. That's how they make their money. So they look a lot closer, right? That's that market mechanism. They have to be able to sell these stoves and they have to use the marketplace with the carbon credits, right? So that's that market mechanism. But their social mission is environmental and helping people. It's very much more tightly wound up with social mission than Patagonia's is, which is looks a lot more like helping um, with helping people 
to get fancy clothing, right? So that they can ski and be warmer when they ski. So they're looking a lot more like a social enterprise. So I'm just trying to get you to look at the spectrum here and think about that spectrum between political authority, economic authority, realized public value, all this stuff. I want you to think about that spectrum and, and, and try and get your mind out of what sort of organizations fit into what boxes and start thinking more about what we're doing that can help and what we're doing that can't help. And that's what I've tried to ask you to do in this assignment today for the discussion is I really want you to think about how social enterprise um, can be used in a variety of ways. And if it's valuable, if it's like Patagonia or if it's that, that's just marketing, right? Is, mar is Patagonia just marketing? I really don't know. I cannot tell if Patagonia goes through all this trouble to make sure that all of their supply chain is, is environmentally and socially responsible. I don't know if it's marketing or not. I mean, they charge a lot more, right? They, they're able to charge a lot more because of that effort. So I, I really, I can't tell you. I can tell you about social entrepreneurship. And that is that nobody knows what we're talking about when we say social entrepreneurship. Some people think it's about adding those market mechanisms, something about social enterprise that's related to social enterprise, where a person, a social entrepreneur, comes into a nonprofit or a government and puts in that market mechanism to try and make it more like a social enterprise. Some people say that's what it is. Some people say it's, I was on a social enterprise panel one time where a guy talked about a policy entrepreneur who took a policy who, that wasn't being used, that was being tested elsewhere, and implemented it in a particular setting where, where you're just combining things. Social entrepreneurship might just be, and my suspicion is, it's just a word for things we like. Oh, I really like, wow, that's something new I haven't seen and I like it. That's social entrepreneurship. I think there's a certain extent to which that's what social entrepreneurship is. So take that uh, with you when you read your assignments there. And um, I think that's about it. I don't think I have any other points to make. So I uh, enjoy the week's reading and as usual, text me or call me or send me an email or join me on my Zoom meeting on Monday from 11 to 1. And have a great week.